Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. Well, I gotta get out here and start harvesting some herbs and stuff. It's still morning and it's beautiful out. And I thought I'd do a quick garden update before I, I uh, harvest back some of this stuff. Um, I may not be harvesting any pansies today, maybe later in the day I might, because yesterday I did some pretty heavy handed harvesting and you can see I've only got maybe one flower on each. And that's what I try to do is leave at least one flower on each one. Um, this one's got a couple of buds coming, so it may look like there's nothing. Same here, getting ready to open up. Here's one of my other pansies, right up here. And I got my hummingbird feeders freshly filled. Since I've been hearing them running around out here, I have three of these. Got two back here and one in the front. All right, and you can see my blueberries are coming along. Um, these are the early blues. Surprisingly, I actually remember the name of these ones. And for our area, this is early. Uh, I know a lot of people down south probably already are harvesting blueberries, but we live in the north, in Washington, on the peninsula, where we get a lot of cold and a lot of rain. And this is my, one of the apple trees I have. I have two apple trees. One we've had for, well, since it was here before we even bought the house. And then this one is simply in a pot and eventually it's supposed to go on the ground. But for now, it stays here. It gets a lot of flowers on it, but you know, we'll get a handful of apples, but they're really great apples. But the blueberries have been in pots since we bought them. We simply just put them in bigger pots from the ones we bought them in, and they've been in these same pots for five years, maybe. And they give us quite a few blueberries. We do very good with these in pots. so. It can be done, people, in limited space. If all you have is deck space, you can grow blueberries in pots. And there's more over here. So we have a total of six blueberry shrubs and all of them in pots. And then Patrick had made these. That's a, just some wood ash I threw in there from the fireplace. I kind of try to spread the wood ash everywhere because it puts good minerals in the soil. But your blueberries typically are gonna like a lot of acid. So grass clippings, blood meal, and chicken manure are the best things for your, your blueberries, especially if they're in pots. But anyway, Pat made these last year, made these little dollies for all these pots. And it makes it much easier to move them around the deck. And he has a video on how he did that. And I'll go ahead and link to it above. So you can see my grapevines are starting to get buds. Again, if you're if you're up here and you're growing your grapes in a greenhouse, you probably might be getting grapes already. Or if you're down south, you've probably got grapes already. But this is about the right time here. Well, one year we had this leaf out really early in like April, I think it was, which is too early for it to start getting, you know, full leaves on it. And then it froze and all the leaves died. However, the once uh, the weather warmed up, it got a whole bunch of new leaves and it did fine. So, you know, still got grapes and all that. So it did pretty good. However, it's better that around here, if it's out here, it waits until this time of the year to start getting its buds. Okay, and then the big thing we've done is we bought, we were gonna use cattle panels, which the funny thing was we went into town, remember that last garden update I did out here and I was talking about getting cattle panels. When we went into town to look at them, they were the ones with the six inch squares, which just so happens to be the same ones that Doug and Stacy used. And I saw their last video and that kind of made me laugh because when we got in there and we looked at them, we're thinking, I think the chickens can possibly fit through those. And so we settled on this fencing here, which is just a, a movable fencing that we can take out at any time. And it's working great to keep the chickens out. They're not really happy about that, but whatever, it's working. <laughs> so, and Patrick, the ladder's out here because Patrick was putting some bird netting up there and then and it's still there. I'm gonna have to take it down. But that is only to keep the robins off of my peas while they first start growing because they come along at this time of year, when the peas start coming up, the robins will come and, and just peck the plants all apart. 
I don't know if they are eating the, the fresh greens or if they're thinking they're worms coming up out of the ground. But until they have more to eat, they'll keep doing that. So we have to protect the peas. That's It's just the peas and some of the flowers we have to worry about. Now right here is my big my biggest catnip plant. It would be a much bigger, but the other day I came out and harvested a whole bunch of it back. And this is what I do with my herbs as early as I can. I just just keep cutting them back and cutting them back and what it's going to do is it's going to make more and it's going to get fuller and I want to do that before it starts getting flowers and then later I will let it go ahead and get some flowers on it because not only is it beautiful the bees just love the catnip flowers um, here I've planted some potatoes this is this is really just a, a secondary spot of growing or maybe a third spot for growing potatoes, just an extra area. And you can see them starting to come up over here. And what I'll do is I'll dig these up as soon as they're ready and then I'll put some herbs in there like uh, amaranth. And you can see my amaranth video from last year. I'll go ahead and link to it up here. This is where I grew the amaranth is right here. And it's, it's just the perfect timing because then I can take, you know, get all the potatoes out, then put the amaranth in there that I've already started somewhere else and then let it grow and it will also feed the soil and get it ready for next year. And so that works really good. So, and I also recently got some, for the first time, some primula because it is also edible, also has some medicinal uses, very similar to the um, pansy. And I thought it would be a nice addition. So this one, this is simply just uh, some leftover fabric from dance costumes that I threw over that just to keep the chickens from pecking that one all apart. And the other two I have in hanging pots. Here's the other one. I love the color of this one. So I just got those this year. And my biggest goji berry is <clears throat> getting lots of leaves on it, looking looking very healthy. And this right here is supposed to be an ashwagandha that I grew last year, and I see nothing coming off of it yet. So I... It is a perennial, but I don't know if it made it through the winter. It's looking like maybe not, but maybe it takes longer. And then what you see right here in front of me is my biggest marshmallow. Well, I think the biggest one was the one that we harvested earlier because Patrick had to dig all this out and that marshmallow was right here. And uh, I have that video. I'll try to link to that as well, where I show the big old roots that we got out of that thing. But anyway, it's a, uh, you can see this one's a pretty good size so that one's the roots on that are probably at least as big as that other one and i'm going to be getting out here in a bit and harvesting my dandelions now is the time you want to get out there and harvest those dandelion flowers right away because um your your flower is going to start slowing down later in the year but i always try to leave a few out for the bees but just in case you don't know this is a true dandelion. There's also the cat's ear. The cat's ear is fine. It's it's healthy. You you can eat it. I had somebody comment on a photo I put up about that the cat's ear can be toxic to horses apparently. So you got to watch out for that if you have horses. But I can show you if I get a chance I'll take you out and show you what a cat's ear looks like. But anyway, at this time of the year, the dandelion are blooming already. But the cats here have yet to start blooming, and there are there are distinct differences. But unless you don't, unless you know, you may not know the difference. But once you learn them, they're really easy to detect. So anyway, we just kind of hook that up there. You just got a nail there, because and, and this is the rest of the fencing, because it's pretty long. So we didn't want to cut it because we may use it, especially if we eventually move, we might want to use it somewhere else. The dandelion leaves. For those who don't know, it, the the word dandelion means dent de lion, which is a uh, tooth of lion. So the dandelion leaves, if you look at it that way, think of it as a tooth right there. So all these little teeth. And I'll show you the cats here. The leaves are very different. And the flowers, the flowers look pretty close to the same, but they grow differently. Now you'll see uh, dandelions will grow on a singular stalk like this, where the cats here, I can't show you how the flowers look yet because they're not blooming at this time, but the cats here will grow this long, very, uh, very delicate, very slender stalk, and then it will, will have several flowers that will come off of that one stalk. So that's one of the ways to tell the difference. There's my spearmint, there's some of my elephant garlic, 
And right there is my one echinacea that made it through this year. I don't know what, why my other two have not come back. But this was the healthiest one. They've been in here for years, but for whatever reason, my other two, one was over there right next to the yarrow, and it's, it's not there anymore. One of my woolly lambs here, just much, much smaller than it used to be. I really thinned it out. I used to have two or three really big ones right in here. Last year, I took the two out that were over here to give me more room because I have more woolly lambs here out front. And then this one I thinned back quite a bit, but it does spread very quickly. But I'm going to be harvesting some of that today. This is another marshmallow. I have four marshmallow plants out here right now. There were five across here, but there's one, two, and there's one right there, just kind of amongst the spearmint, so it's kind of hidden. Camouflaged. I have oregano with a big chunk of garlic growing right in the middle of it. <laughs> there's another elephant garlic, um, and then there's another oregano there. I just put this, I got it from a friend, put it in uh, in the fall, and it's coming back. I want it right in the middle of the garden. So rhubarb, for those who don't know, this is some of my mojito mint. Um, I've already thinned a lot of it back. And yes, people probably think I'm crazy that I grow my mints in my garden. But I like to do this because it does help with pest control. Um, to me, it's actually easier to thin the uh, mints from the main garden because the soil is going to be looser. So I just kind of go out here. So I'm going to work this. I still got to do this and I'll thin it back to the main plant. And it's pretty easy to do. I still got some over there I got to get. But then this is the one, I still got to get the grass out of it, but this is the one um, plantain I like to keep in here. I like to have one good healthy plantain in here, but the bad thing about growing plantain in your main garden is that it keeps making more, just like dandelion. And so you've got to really keep up on it or it will take over. And another fever few, another fever few. Most of these are volunteers. Some of them I've moved around from where they came up just to kind of have a, because these two here were initially coming up in the potato patch, which I got to get to that in a bit and show you what we got going on. So let's take a look at our peas and see what they're doing. Okay, no, I don't have any peas in that section. I've only planted the peas here. So you can see right there, right there and there and there. Now they're finally getting a chance. They were up there, then the robins came and pecked them all back down. So Pat threw these up and now they're able to start growing again. <laughs> and some random kale coming up out here. That's where, this is where I grow my tomatillos. Two years ago, when I first started my channel, I was growing uh, ground cherries out here. But then I switched to tomatillos. I love ground cherries, but tomatillos have so much more use for me. Uh, right here is um, one of these days. I'll explain this pipe. Well, I can just explain it real quick. It has to do with our rainwater collection, and that's why it's going across here. But one of these days, maybe I'll go more into detail about that. But anyway, right here, I decided I took out all my strawberries. Well, because they never really gave me much strawberries right there. However, last year, if you saw my videos from last year, I had some uh, uh, blueberry cherry tomatoes growing here and they did excellent here. I wasn't crazy about the blueberry cherry tomatoes. I just didn't think they had a lot of great flavor. So this year I'm gonna try some red cherries and plant them here and see how well they do. So I've got this kind of <laughs> patched together with some bird netting to keep the chickens out of this area because obviously they dig everything up. And then I'll show you what we've been doing with this here, or what Patrick's been doing, is he got this all boxed in, finally, after several years, he was able to get this boxed in to really, you know, get it raised up. And then um, last year, I mean, this has always been my main potato patch right here. But what we're doing is we're putting in a actually a walkway and leaving it like raised beds on either side so I'm not done digging that out I just have to figure out where else I know I have more places I want that dirt to go I think I'm going to go put it over my raspberries and uh, then along the sides here is where I'll plant my squash you know I'll have spaghetti squash pumpkin and I plan on doing butternut squash again this year because I haven't done it in a few years and then the potatoes will grow here Obviously, I won't be growing as many potatoes as before because we're cutting this big section out for a, a pathway. 
but that's okay i've got potatoes uh, now that i've got that bigger section out front i've got potatoes growing out there and uh and then anyway we'll have this for as before growing the squash and the beans and and all that on and then eventually we're looking at um covering this and making it a second greenhouse and obviously be planting things other than potatoes in there <laughs> but it'd be a really good place for cucumbers peppers and tomatoes and then free up the the, the main greenhouse for some other things shaky birds are you trying to tell me it's time to come out yes they get all kinds of goodies thrown in there to them lettuces and cabbage. I've got some strawberries planted. These are the ones I took out of that section in front of the greenhouse, so we'll see how they do here. Typically, they do pretty good in these pots up here. And then usually I put them down here, but this year I'm doing lettuces in these little pots. And then back there is just another trellis that Patrick built last year. I think we have a video on that for the grapevines to continue on this way. And this is all three grapevines that go around, all around the deck, up the steps, and all around. And I love how it ends up looking in midsummer when it's just all nothing but green. But you can either wait and see that to come, or you can go check out some of our videos from last year or even the year before. It shows it was just this big wall of green. In fact, I'll just go ahead and link to our grape harvest from the fall so you can see how that looked and how many grapes we got off of that and i always forget to show this rhubarb this is a rhubarb i've had all along so i have three now but this was the first one i got and for whatever reason it likes it up here next to the house with no direct sunlight i tried twice to move it in a place where it got some direct sunlight one was full sun one was maybe partial sun and both times it just it just withered up so it likes it right here i don't i'm sorry i can't tell you what variety of this is for those who would like to grow rhubarb in the shade uh, i really don't know but it gives me a beautiful dark red rhubarb um and it just it just does great over here in the shady little corners all right i decided to go ahead and place a, a leaf of a dandelion and a cat's ear side by side so you can see the very distinct differences between the two. Now the cat's ear you may not be able to see in this, but it's it's very fuzzy and that's where it gets its name. And if you look at it from there, it does kind of look like a cat's ear. Plus it being fuzzy as well, where your dandelion leaf is not fuzzy at all. And so you can see the very distinct difference where you got these tooth-like appendages coming off of here on the leaf, but the cat's ear, it does have some points to it, but they're not near as defined as on the dandelion. So that's another way you can tell the difference. And then later in the year when the cat's ear are blooming, I will show you side by side comparison between the flowers and how they grow and the dandelion. So you can tell the difference. Now again, the cat's ear does, it is good for you. It is edible to humans. Um, it does ha have some medicinal properties, but they just do not compare to the dandelion. All right, now I'm out front. You can see my, I moved my golden oregano from last year out here for a couple reasons. One, because Patrick had to dig it up from where it was at, but also because when the grapevines fill in midsummer, the golden oregano stops getting as much sun as it really needs. And so out here, especially now that the neighbor's trees are gone, it should get plenty of sun. And back there is where my stinging nettle is. It doesn't look like much right now because I harvested a whole bunch, but there's also a bunch of all that other garbage back there is that stupid chokeweed. And then out here, here's some more potatoes. These I was at least able to get in the ground in time. And I've got, I moved some more strawberries out here. And I've also planted some calendula and nasturtium in here. And then this one open section right here, there's a couple more potatoes right in there. And then this open section right here, I'm going to try to see how well zucchini will do here. And then that's another rhubarb I got from the same friend. There's my comfrey plant. There's kind of a story about that one. The one that I thought I'd killed. I had it in pots years ago. And then it dried up, you know, and then it finally just didn't like being in the pot anymore. And I thought it was dead, threw it under the hedges, and it came back. And so I moved it out here 
thinking I didn't mind if it took over this area at that time because I didn't have I didn't have all this here at that time. It was just way back there. Back the the garden area only went back to just right in front of those shrubs there. And so I stuck it here. Well, it doesn't get because of this juniper, it doesn't get as much light as I think it would like. However, I took a chunk of it last year and planted it over here. This needs to be mowed again already. I can't believe this. I just mowed this. Anyway, I planted it right here next to the peach tree because I heard or read somewhere that comfrey at the base of your fruit trees is supposed to be really good for it. So we'll see. I hope I'm right because I know comfrey can take over. But it's a really, uh, a real good herb to grow if you're not growing it already. It's great for skin care. It's also known as a, a bone knit because it's, you can use it for healing and broken then over bones. Back to the, around to the west side herb garden. My other nice size goji berry, this was the one that actually got a few berries on it last year. And it's looking pretty healthy so far. Marshmallow, my roses. Um, uh, more oregano. I think I'm going to be digging up some of my oregano because I have just more than I can use and I'd rather use this space for something else. Feverfew, another sage. I've been cutting some of this back and using it for making vinegars as some of you saw. Ran, uh, some wild feverfew that planted itself. I'm just leaving it for now in case somebody wants some plants. Um, here I dug, this was all orange mint. It was all out here. And I'm still trying to decide if I want to take it all out. I don't know yet. Um, I don't like the orange mint for flavor near as much as my other mints, but I love the smell. But I did dig a bunch out and dig it back to the main plant and planted some calendula and nasturtiums in here. Um, great. I see buttercup coming up in there. Doggone that stuff. Anyway, there's another one of my woolly lambs here. My biggest lavender. Elderberry. I stood on my lemon balm uh, twice now, and I'll probably come out here in a few more days and get some more. And I sh looks like oregano is going to be the herb I need to do today. Look at that. My goodness. I did harvest a bunch of sage yesterday and put it on the dehydrator, as well as, you know, using some for starting vinegar. This is more mojito mint. This is probably my favorite mint right here, the mojito. I love peppermint because peppermint's strong. But mojito, I don't know, it just has such a really nice flavor. And then there's my biggest woolly lambs here. And my smallest, elderberry. And peppermint, not quite ready yet. I could start harvesting it now, but I'm going to let it get a little bit bigger. And then I'm just going to take it way back. Uh, my rosemary is doing great, by the way. Um, so this is the perfect spot. I've actually harvested a bunch off. I think I probably just on what I've harvested so far and dried already this year. I've got enough to last us for the whole next year. So I think I'll be doing good on the rosemary. I'm so glad it'll be the first time that I'll get that kind of rosemary that I can dry up and last us for a whole year. And then I'm thinking next year I'll probably be able to get enough to last us for, you know, two or three years. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I got a couple of times. Time is the other thing that I have issues with. I'm hoping I can start getting harvesting enough of those to last us a year. And then, yes, another sage. So three big sage plants that give me far more than I can ever use. And I just thin some of it out, cut a bunch of it back. Another catnip. And then... I don't know. I've got some garlic growing here and a few other random things, but... I there's this kind of open space. I've got some horseradish back there, but this area right here, I'd like to put something in, and I don't know what to what I want to put in there yet. I've got a lilac that I just bought from a friend, but I'm thinking I'm concerned that this section here does not get enough sun. As you can see right now, nothing has sun on it. But in the summertime, this gets especially that down down there up to about the center gets what I would say full sun and the fact that I think it gets about eight hours, but that's only in the summer. So I don't think that would be the best place for the lilac. I, I have to figure out what I want to do with it. I'm just really happy to finally have a lilac because I want the flowers for doing all kinds of stuff with.
Anyway, there's my up garden update so far. There's a lot more to come. I hope this wasn't too long. Um, I'm really loving how my bed, my herb bed is looking. It needs some cleanup on the edges, I know, but I don't usually worry about it because usually the bed, especially when everything's growing, is just so beautiful that nobody cares about what the trend, what the what the grass line looks like. But anyway, so there we are. There'll be more updates coming on the gardens. And I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching. Take care, and God bless.